morning, everybody, and welcome to the Town Board of the Town of Austin work session for September 17th, 2018. Please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So thank you everybody for attending um, our work session this evening. Um, we have two items that we are going to be discussing, only two, and that is um, leaf blower legislation and accessory apartment legislation. I'm looking at you <laughs> because uh, we are we had originally thought we were going to also be talking about our solar codes, but unfortunately our planner David Stallman could not be here this evening, and we were hoping that he would guide us through. Um, a little bit of the conversation and um, we're instead going to um, plan to have him at our next uh, when, when we have our public hearing which is next week the 25th 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 of September um, where we will follow it with a work session um, on our solar code uh, okay so thanks for coming. Uh, for anybody who might be here in the audience, I'm not saying anybody is, but just if you might be here in the audience to hear us deliberate on solar. Okay. Um, with that, I will just jump right in. And I, I also want to mention that we are going to be having, um, going into executive session at the end of this work session um, for a brief conversation, uh, advice of counsel and personnel. Um, Otherwise, I want to share a few quick announcements before we discuss our um, work session topics. First, I want to share a very important message from our receiver of taxes, Holly Perlowitz. Please share this message with your neighbors, especially those that may not use email or regularly tune into our town board meetings uh, to help us spread the word as best as possible. The 2018-19 school taxes are due on September 30th, 2018. This year, September 30th, is a Sunday, so payments can be received in the tax office through Monday, October 1st, without penalty, and those mailed with a United States Postal Service postmark as of October 1st will also be accepted without penalty. Bills were mailed to our taxpayers who pay their taxes directly versus through a mortgage company from the printer on August 21st. The vast majority of taxpayers received their bills, but we have been getting calls from other taxpayers who did not receive their bills. The tax office can email a duplicate to any taxpayer who has not received a bill and also mail you a duplicate. If you have not received your tax bill, please contact the tax office by sending an email to H. Perlowitz. That's P as in Paul, E-R-L-O-W-I. T is in Tom, Z is in Zebra, at townofostening.com or call 914-762-8790. Our New York State tax law states that penalties must be assessed if payments are not received on time for whatever reason, even if the taxpayer does not receive their bill in the mail. As we've discovered this tax season, municipalities cannot control the mail and property owners are expected to know when taxes are due. Unfortunately, municipalities have no authority to waive any penalties assessed, so please make sure to pay your taxes by the date they are due. We have been actively working with the United States Postal Service to identify the problem that caused non-delivery of bills. We have notified Senator Schumer's office because they have also been very involved with um, problem deliveries in Westchester County by the United States Postal Service uh, regarding these mail issues. So you should know that we are being aggressively um, active on this and investigating to uh, the extent possible where uh, something got went wrong. We do have information that it was not just Austinine, but other municipalities as well. I do want to thank tax receiver Perlowitz and her staff, Deputy Receiver Patty Cunningham and Martha Quidisaka, for their due diligence on behalf of our taxpayers and for always providing excellent customer service in the tax office. In other news, we are excited to be partnering with the Village of Austin and Green Austin to celebrate International Car Free Day this Friday, September 21st. Join on the resources of 511 New York Rideshare 
we've been working together to find innovative solutions to reducing the number of single occupancy vehicles on our roads. This is um, great because it will help reduce our need to um, as quickly improve our roads if we have fewer vehicles on them because they won't take as much of a toll, as well as improve our air quality and make it less expensive for those um, who regularly get in their cars to go anyplace. In an effort to encourage people to consider alternative modes of transportation, like bicycles, you may notice some bright green bikes around the town and village this week. The village and town are excited to be working with Lime, a dockless bike share company, to operate a pop-up program in Austin uh, from this past Saturday, September 15th, when they rolled out their Lime bikes um, around town and village through Friday, September 21st, to get the community ready for Car Free Day. This will be a pilot program to gauge community interest in the possibility of an expanded dockless bike share program here in Austin. The Lime Bike Delivery crew drew a crowd at the farmer's market on Saturday. I'm hopeful this pilot program will be well received by the community, and I encourage everyone to get their helmets out, download the Lime Bike app, and get ready to go car free or even car light next Friday. So please start by taking the pledge at www.511nyr dot org slash car free day h v as in hudson valley i'm third and i did take the pledge already and um look for me on my bicycle coming to 16 croton avenue i took the pledge too okay so i encourage you guys all to take the pledge and go car free or car light is also helpful car light means like you try to avoid having to use your car for as much at, at, you know, one only you in a car. You consider carpooling, and that's the other thing that um, that um, rideshare five hundred one rideshare does is it gives you an opportunity to um, sign up to try to find carpools that might be going at the same time to the place that you're going and returning to the same uh, place that you're returning at the same time. Um, so it's a great it's a great um, organization. It's part of New York State Department of Transportation, and they've been working with us to set up portals um, through the village and town. Um, for employees of the village and town as well, and also working with local employers. Um, and we have had great interest by our, some of our local employers, so we're very excited about that too. On Thursday, September 20th, the Austin Documentary and Discussion Series will feature the Westchester premiere of Capturing the Flag, a documentary that focus on, focuses on the efforts of a team of charismatic voter protection volunteers that travel from New York City to Fayetteville, North Carolina, traveled during the 2016 presidential election in an effort to fight against voter suppression. This timely documentary should be very interesting as the county and country prepares for the 2018 midterm elections in November. The screening begins at 6.30 p.m. in the Austin Public Library's Budar Theater and is followed by a post-screening Q&A with Laverne Berry, the producer of the film, and Laura Hogan, an attorney specializing in the appellate practice. This Friday, September 21st, there are two great opportunities to enjoy some local music in two of Austin's most unique venues. Unique venues, because you can't modify unique. Sorry about that. Doors at the Austin Arts Council Steamer Firehouse Gallery open at 7 p.m. for a performance by Austin favorite KJ Denner. Tickets are $20 or $15 for Austin Arts Council members and can be purchased at austinartscouncil.org. Also be sure to get your tickets now for the Ferry Sloop 7th Annual Concert for the River fundraiser at the Camp Woods Grounds Auditorium, also on Friday the 21st at 7 p.m., featuring three-time Grammy winner Tom Chapin and the Greg Jacqueline Band. All proceeds from the benefit will be used towards maintenance and restoration of the Ferry Sloop's boat, educational programs, and the organization's continued effort to keep the Hudson River clean and safe for future generations. For tickets and for more information, visit ferrysloops.org. Westchester Collaborative Theater will be holding their Revel on the River Fall fundraiser at the Shattamuck Yacht Club on Saturday, September 22nd. Come on down for a night of music, dancing, live theater, an open bar, silent and live auctions, and get this, a gourmet taco bar. Hello! Come celebrate the first day of fall while supporting the local art and theater here in Austin. Grab your tickets at wctheater.org. On Sunday, September 23rd, there are several events scheduled here in Austin and Briarcliff. Fable Farms will be hosting its 2018 Farm Fest Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., featuring local artisan vendors, cooking demos, yoga, 
an opportunity to feed the chickens, and more. For more information, visit fablefoods.com slash farmfest. The Briarcliff Manor Scarborough Historical Society will be hosting a discussion Sunday on the spires and their Waldheim estate with Alex Vastola taking us on a look inside the brick walls at the Briarcliff Library Community Center at 2 p.m. For more information, contact Shelley Glick at the Briarcliff Library at 941-7072 or Karen Smith at Briarcliff Manor at BMSHS at mail at briarcliffhistory.org. Marion-Dale Center's Tree Huggers Ball is scheduled for Sunday, September 23rd, the first day of fall from 4.30 to 7 p.m. Enjoy a reception, seasonal beverages, and small plates. Marion-Dale News and a candlelit labyrinth walk on Marion-Dale's beautiful waterfront grounds. Tickets are available at marion-dale.org. I think T-Town is hosting their Night in the Woods also on Sunday, and I believe it starts at either 6 or 7 p.m., and I'm not exactly sure where it is, but if you go to t-town.org, you can find out more information about their fundraiser. Sick of the summer clutter? Registration closes on Monday, September 24th for the Green Osnane Fall Community Tag Sale on Saturday, October 6th. For $25, receive a double-sided sign to post on your lawn three days before the sale, additional signs to hang around your neighborhood, a link to your home and item, your items for sale on their Google map, and promotion in the Penny Saver, local press, bulletins, and assorted social media outlets. So it's a great deal if you want to have um, get rid of some of your stuff. Don't forget to tell your neighbors. Um, block and multifamily sales save on registration costs. Happy decluttering. For more information and to sign up, please go to greenaustin.org slash tag sale. Also remember to follow Green Austin Townwide Tag Sale. Austin and Briarcliff Manor Facebook page to discover what great things are for sale. And that is it for my announcements. Are there any other announcements? Once, going twice. Okay. So, in that case, let us launch into our conversation about leaf blowers. So, we have had um, a number of public hearings on a leaf blower. I'm not going to call it a ban, but I'll say reducing leaf blower use in the summer months um, in the town of Austin, particularly from May 31st through September 30th. Um, we had considered also having some exemptions, and we've heard uh, from the community that there's some of this that they don't feel so great about. We've mostly heard from landscapers, a uh, local lawnmower uh, company, and uh, some uh, multifamily homeowners, I guess, or homeowners associations that they feel it isn't fair for us to have this ban apply in some cases and not in other cases. Uh, where is the cutoff uh, for certain size properties? Should it be here? Should it be there? Should we keep, should we not include electric uh, leaf blowers because they make as much noise? Etc. So I wanted to just come back and have the conversation with the board to see and hear where everybody um, stands on this and possibly um, talk about collecting some more information. Um, so let, I just, I'd like to hear from my colleagues first and then I'll try to um, do a little summing up and add in my two cents. Um, I think the, the biggest thing that came out of the public hearing are we heard that their leaf blowers are used for uses that we had never heard of. Um, so those are some of the things we need to consider. Also, I, I think that was a, it was a fair point that the exemption for some and not for others is an issue, and that's something we have all been struggling with. So that's definitely something we need to consider, because that's a fair point. Okay. Do you want to talk? <clears throat> no, I was, just, I was going to say that I, I, I don't know. I, I've, I've seen a lot of leaf blower work. Even on the uh, streets when they are ready to repave, they blow, they blow all the sand and stuff off the off the right. black top and everything. I, you're gonna have to make exceptions, and that's gonna that's gonna cause a problem with other with these these guys. I, I just for an example today, I rode down uh, Spring Street. And they got wide, wide, uh, what you call it, you know, from the sidewalk to the 
the space in there where they yeah. cut the grass. The islands, okay. you could say. Right. And they cut the grass, and the grass is all out in the street. Mm -hmm. And they just have to cut the grass all in. So what are they, they going to use a broom and sweep it up? And that's what I think these guys are complaining about. They, they're talking hours and hours more. I, and I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to please everybody. I just don't see how that's going to work. Because it's going to, they, they need the leaf blowers. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. So, you know, I, I, I don't think anybody um, anticipated this would be as controversial as it is. And I think that there is really legitimate concerns on both sides. Um, I, I do think that some of the concerns that have been voiced, we have to um, make sure that people understand the time frame that we're talking about is May 31st to September 30th. So the rest of the year, leaf blowers would be able to use. So there were some concerns about landscapers who use them for light snow. It doesn't appear to me that that would be affected at all. So there, um, it's not a draconian ban on leaf blowers. So the, the, the intent of it is to um, minimize the noise, noise pollution and um, also minimize some of the environmental um, implications of, of leaf blower use. One of the challenges is that the electric leaf blowers don't necessarily have the performance. Um, so that if we're talking about noise pollution, then that could actually be worse with electric blowers that may have to be run longer now because they're not as strong as. So from a noise position view, I'm not sure there's a real good argument. Um, the one thing about in the summer, you know, when people are more likely to be out in their yards, it is awfully nice when it's quieter rather than you're, you're you know, finally get off on a Saturday and somebody finally has a chance to blow their leaves and then finally somebody has, you know, and then you have to listen to it. So it goes both ways. Um, I, I do think that we also have to start really thinking about making more conscious decisions about um, the cost of pristine uh, lawns and, and what the environmental cost of the best looking lawn is. Uh, there's some things that, that I've learned about through all of this that um, maybe you don't really have to do as much as you think you have to do it and could actually save you money because um, you don't necessarily have to get every leaf off your lawn um, to keep a lawn healthy and to keep your neighborhood looking nice. So it does seem to me that there's there's got to be a compromise here. I think that this legislation goes a long way to that. Um, but I don't want to do anything that creates undue hardship for small business owners too. So I think there is a little bit more information. I think that we'll, with all these things, the devil's always in the details. And um, you know, the, the issue of enforcement has been raised too, which I believe has been a concern in some of the, and an issue in some of the other municipalities. So if we're going to do something, let's make sure it's something that we can all live by and enforce and um, we all understand and buy into the overall intent because it really is to benefit everybody across the board. It's not meant to be punitive on anybody. It's for better environment, better health quality for the people who are actually using the blowers, for the people who are near them, um, quieter neighborhoods. So there's something in it for us all to benefit from, and we really have to make sure that we're working from that common shared interest. Thanks for that uh, summary. I think that, um, first of all, I agree with you know all of the points that, that pretty much everybody has made, and I think that that's why it's it's a little bit complicated. Um, one, a couple of other things besides, also besides enforcement, and some of the things that we, I think that the intent of this is to really improve the environment, right? I mean, ultimately improve the environment, whether it's quality quality of life in your environment and your quality of life, uh, whether it's um, not to disturb the ground cover um, and, you know, or it's to um, not put pollutants into the air. So we're talking about air quality, we're talking about soil quality, um, and we're talking about noise pollution. Those are, those are in my opinion, those are the main uh, things that we're trying to get at. And in so doing, we have an opportunity to potentially lower costs. So the other um, suggestion that has come up with this is the, the whole notion of love them and leave them or mulching in place. And instead of just getting um, 
a grass, something that cuts your grass or um, blows, you know, moves the leaves around into to be collected and dealt with, that we're looking at um, actually leaving the in the organic materials back on your lawn so that they can continue to help your lawn be more fertile and grow and um, not necessarily be perfectly weed free because that can be okay, um, but to still be green and still um, offer benefits to, um, you know, and habitats for all of the many things that support our environment, whether they're insects or other otherwise. Um, so I think that, again, that that's the overall intention of this. We're not looking to be punitive. One of the things that, that's come up and that I know I've mentioned a number of times is that there are how many other, I think, how many other communities that are in Westchester County that have already adopted some type of leaf blower ban? Like 12, I would I say think. close to 20. Well, I was going to say 12 to 15 or something like that, right? Close to 20. Close to 20. Um, so we know that these bans are in place. We know that that there are landscaping companies that are still in business. Um, and in fact, as um, Councilwoman DeTore pointed out in a sidebar conversation that we have, you know, this could actually increase business for, for, the, la for the lawn mowing companies because instead of your next lawn mower or your next, whatever, your next lawn mower just being the same one that you bought, you can now buy one that actually mulches the leaves in place and then hopefully improves um, the look of your lawn or the health of your lawn. Uh, so anyway, th th that's just from my perspective, th like that's the objective. Again, as um, Councilwoman Dettori mentioned, the devil is in the details. Um, we know that we have gotten pushback because we know that these blowers are not just for leaves. They are for acorns. They're used to blow sometimes organic fertilizers and non-organic fertilizers and pesticides. Um, onto uh, to lawns and to other areas. Um, and they're also used to clean um, detritus from the pavement. And I think that in some respects, that might be where our biggest issue is coming in is for some of these other uses, because if in fact you're mulching in place, you really probably don't need to use a blower to get rid of the material that's on your lawn but you may need to get rid of material that's on walkways or, or roadways. And we have to, it seems to me like we still maybe need to do a little bit more investigation as to how other municipalities are dealing with some of these issues, um, even if they have a leaf blower ban in place. So um, that as well as the issue of enforcement, um, at, from some of my conversations with um, some of the folks from Green Austin who brought this legislation to us in the first place, um, they talked about this like, in the same context as like, you know, pooper scooper laws, where there's not a lot of um, police enforcement of the pooper scooper laws. It's more that people start to get an understanding of what these laws are. And it's even the same with, um, with actually, you know, smoking in our playgrounds or, or, um, or, or parks. You know, we don't, we don't send the cops around to go necessarily enforcing that, but, but people enforce them on their own by putting pressure on their neighbors and saying, or, you know, or their, or somebody that's in the park and saying, you know, you're not allowed to smoke in the park, or, you know, you didn't pick up your doggy doo doo and you need to pick that up or whatever it is. And you, I, I just would say that the, the, I have an issue with that analogy. Um, pooper scooper laws and no smoking are public health laws. So there is really no um, consequence to anybody who's a business owner. So like one of the biggest issues is that the cost associated with the equipment that you use. So if you ask me not to smoke because it's, it's a public health issue, this is an environmental health issue and it is a public and it is a health issue for people who use it. I don't want to discount that, but there's no cost um, burden to people either way, whether they smoke or, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that it's, it's health costs. So, while I understand the enforcement part of it, mm -hmm. I don't know that this will work quite the same way. Because again, you're talking about something where the, what, some of the things that, that people whose livelihoods depend on using leaf blowers at different times of the year for different things are concerned because either they feel rightly or wrongly, and this is where we need more information, that 
they won't be able to afford the new equipment, that the new equipment won't work as well, that their livelihoods are, are in jeopardy. In the case of Cooper Scooper Law or smoking, that's not the case. I was only using the comparison for enforcement. But but what you're but the reason the enforcement works is because people self people self enforce. Right. But I don't think that's gonna happen with leaf blowers. Like I don't think that same analogy is gonna happen because you're asking somebody to do something that um, I, I don't think it's the same thing, so I don't think it's a, it's an apt analogy. I mean, if my neighbor had four people on their lawn, which would never happen because he takes pride in his own lawn doing it himself, but if my neighbor were to have four people out on his lawn on a, on a Saturday morning, um, you know, during the summer months, getting rid of all the stuff and blowing everything all around, you don't think I would say something? I mean, people might say something. You you, you might know. say something, but again, it's not your neighbor doing it. It's the people he hired, and if the people yeah. he hired. But again, like I think it obfuscates. But, and and but is it, do we want to put so much pressure that people feel that they're like what's happening here is people whose livelihoods depend on this feel threatened, mm -hmm. rightly or wrongly, because they feel that they're not going to be able to do the business. So. Yes, public pressure and public awareness, that's an important piece. I'm not disagreeing with that. But I think that when we discount the impact it may have on somebody's ability to put food on their table, then we have to also make sure there's an interim solution for that too because the technology may not catch up quickly enough. Or if they buy things now, if they invest in the, the machinery that's available now, and they have to reinvest in it in two years when more better equipment. That that's I really think that's the heart of the issue. So while I agree that there'll be pressure and everything, there's still a hardship on a certain amount of people, even if they're trying to do the right thing. And that's what the essence of the of the controversy is about. So it's it's not about anybody thinks it's okay to degrade the environment necessarily. It's not about so I think we really have to focus on that because I don't think the enforcement will work quite the same way as it does when you're doing something that is, is um, again, there's no economic disadvantage to somebody just picking up their, you know. I just, I'm just, I just feel like I understand what you're saying, and I'm not saying that we should discount any of those things that you're talking about, but I was only speaking about the issue of enforcement. So, so okay. okay, that is, I'm okay, saying. Okay, but I'm, I don't necessarily agree with that. That's all I'm all saying. All I'm saying is you're saying it wouldn't be enforced, and then you're tying that comment into that it affects people's livelihoods. And I understand it affects people's livelihoods, but that doesn't discount the fact that you may get people to enforce it by just complaining to their neighbors. That's all I'm saying. Like, I don't necessarily believe that our, that we're expecting our, uh, police force to go around enforcing that. That's what, that's kind of what I'm saying. I'm saying that I think that it's more of a, a neighbor to neighbor or, you know, issue that that's how people would take it up. And I'm not, again, discounting any of your points that you're saying about why it's a, a consideration for those other reasons. But in terms of enforcement, that's, that was the point that I was trying to make. Did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah. I, I, this <clears throat> neighbor to neighbor thing is, is like a, in other words, neighbor snitching on neighbor. But I, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to get into that. But what I am going to tell you is that we're talking about mulching. There are, there are, there are lawnmowers out here right now that mulches, you, you know. Right. You're, you're, but how, how long can you mulch and leave it? It builds up. That is a question that I don't know the answer to, yeah, but well, I know I'm that we do it. we do mulch in the parks and we don't blow it. We we mulch the leaves, and it doesn't it doesn't build up. So if it's on the lawn, it's going to build up. Yeah, but again, if you do it again, if you do it regularly, it depends on how many. They leaves, mulch the right? grass in the parks and the yes. first couple leaves, but I don't think they mulch all the leaves, do they? You can't. Okay. If you mulch all leaves. those leaves that fall out there, you're going to have a pile out there on the Okay. But again, anyway, it I can't mulch all of my leaves in my lawn. No. Right. I mean, I guess, again, it depends, right? On and your property. It depends on how many how many leaves you have, how big your property is, how what kind of trees you have, where they when they all fall. Like, every year it could be different. So it does depend. Um, so we haven't necessarily heard from the environmental uh, community. Except in writing, um, we haven't actually heard from from them at any public hearings. Or from the EAC. Uh, the EAC, we're waiting to hear. Right. Right. We haven't gotten anything yet from them. 
Are we are keeping our public hearing open. I think what we should do is try to is try to um, get a little bit more information. The other su suggestion is that our our leaf blower law looks different than their draft leaf blower law looks different than the villages, and we may want to be on the same page with the village. Um, Maybe they want to be on the same page with us. Correct. Right. That, that we want to be on the same page as each other. Um, as one another. So we may want to just take a look. I, they haven't had any public hearings yet. I think there's on until October. Um, and they, I think they just introduced this. So we should um, just see, take a look and see if what, what the issues are. Um, and they may be different in the town. I'm not saying that we should absolutely, but that was a suggestion that came from Green Austin also. The, 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 I believe the village's legislation is proposing a ban on all gas powered leaf blowers, so, uh, which is not our ban. And again, I, I'm not a proponent, like I'm not pro gas power leaf blowers. I don't think anybody is, but I do have a question as to the veracity of the fact that the electric ones aren't, well, we've heard that from our own staff, that the electric ones yeah. don't do a good enough job. And we so may not again, be there yet. And, and again, you know, I, I, this is controversial, but what, what's different about it than other things, and the point I was trying to make is, yes, you may have people enforcing, but it's not... You're, you're going to call your neighbor to who probably has no idea what leaf blowers or you know what they're doing on their property. So it, you're really not complaining about your neighbor. You're complaining about your labor, neighbor's landscaping things. Now the good news is that gets awareness and people start thinking, oh, what is my landscaper doing and how's it affecting me? And those are all really really good things. But at the end of the day, if you're you know if your neighbor's committed to having a lawn a certain way and that's the expectation, that's what they want, um, and the landscaper, you know, like it's it's just more complicated because you do have an element of, of business in, involved that you don't have with um, your typical public health law. So I think that while you certainly will have neighbors who are going to be more concerned than others, that um, and that's a good thing, um, but it's not going to you're not going to have the same ability to put the pressure because you have a business component that just doesn't exist otherwise. So. I think that if we want this to be successful, what I'm saying is we have to acknowledge that it's not completely analogous, that the end result will be still be a neighbor who has issues now about how they're going to maintain the lawn the way they you know, are anticipating to do it, and then being able to have a business to be able to respond to that. So I do think that we need to understand the cost implication to people who are doing that work, um, and in conjunction with with greater awareness as you have with everything environmental about why things that we thought for years were a good thing, whether it's blowing leaves or, or putting fertilizer down or anything else were a good thing, may not be what they, we think they are. I think it's a lot more complicated. And you know, my experience is that even though it seems like a lot of work to unpack it, that the more you unpack it to figure out what really the root things is that then when you actually implement something, it's more successful as to be doing a, a knee jerk thing. and and. Again, if the technology isn't there yet and people have to invest in a lot more equipment, that burden, that expense is, is con potentially considerable. So that's something that we at least have to acknowledge is going to be a repercussion of this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that you know, the environment should lose out because of that, but it just is a reality of what we need to do to make sure it's successful. I mean, I would also yeah. just argue that one of the other ways that we get changes to equipment, like lawn equipment, is by building up demand for better equipment that doesn't have as negative an impact on the environment, just the same way that you can build up demand for solar power. So, I mean, good, so this is an area where we would want to engage with the landscapers to do that because they have a much better, the landscape, a coalition of landscapers putting pressure has a lot has 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 a lot of weight too because they're buying the equipment. Absolutely. So to I, I don't disagree sorry. with you, but we should be engaging that particular community, the community that uses them the most. In we all need to be talking from the same side, and that's where I think there has to be more conversation. I agree. Didn't the sustainable Westchester people say they had some electric leaf blowers that might be? Decent. I mean, the one that the thing that swayed me the most is the Austin lawnmower owner saying that this technology they do not have equipment made yet that is capable of doing what the landscapers needed to do. And to me, 
I think we need to, if that's true, we can't expect somebody to work with some without proper tools. Um, I have a problem with that. So that, that bothers me the most. Sustainable Westchester seemed to feel they had some pretty good electric leaf blowers. I'd like to see the one the Austin lawnmower has, let our guys look at it, see the ones that's sustainable so that they would bring over to us, let our guys look at that and see how they like those. Maybe invite some of the landscapers over to look at them also. There's a couple of big companies in town that have been pretty vocal. Let them take a look at the equipment. Um, I mean, I, stopping somebody from being able to do their business. I'm all in favor of mulching mowers. I mean, I would love to suggest that, you know, I think that doesn't the village have a list of, um, or Green Austin have a list of which companies use mulching mowers and do green practices? Because I know a lot of people are looking for that. And I think if more, if we can put a list out of people who do the green practices, I know a lot of homeowners want that. That's an aside. Mm -hmm. But I do, I agree that we have a lot more investigations to do on the actual implications. And then, you know, do we exempt ourselves or not? I'm not really sure we should, so. Yeah, I think and then, it's a hard thing if we exempt yeah, ourselves. Yeah, from, I don't, that's to me a You know, a like if, if we're expecting in. everybody else to do it, then we should probably have to do it too. Mm -hmm. So I think we should understand the implications of that for both ourselves and for our businesses and our homeowners who want to do it themselves. So I think we have some more investigations to do. Yeah, you do, I think so too. And uh, one more thing is, uh, excuse me, do you think maybe we could uh, find out uh, the, let's say, Fence of Tarrytown? I saw a sign there saying about the lawnmower thing. Uh, find out what has happened or how things have progressed with them. Yeah. And, and that's, I don't know how long ago they've been doing it, but. Yeah. That's that exactly might, what we were saying that we want to do. We want to do some more investigation as to how it's going into these other municipalities. That have had this these leaf blower bans in place in terms of what has happened with their landscaping community, um, their you know their landscaping businesses, how they've handled it in their own municipalities in terms of if they if they have had a ban or not, and if there was any pushback from exempting themselves, and, and if they have, um, and what enforcement has been like. So I mean I think that those are some of the the top issues that we need to look at, right? So enforcement, um, technology. Technology, that's that's an extra one, which I didn't mention, but yes. But yeah. Well, if we know that, right. then how can we enforce it? Right. What sort of programs are available that incentivize use of, of more environmentally friendly equipment? This, like, are there even programs the way that you have for, you know, getting people to buy an electric car where you're giving a, a tax rebate? Because those are things that, too, because I think that the way you're going to get the, the business community and, like, it's, it's going to have to be viable for them um, so part of it will be demand and part of it will be the fact that they can you know get a break um, you know still still have a viable business so well, one of the other things that we did talk about was possibly permitting fees um, so that would be again you need to permit get a, a permit to use uh, a leaf blower during the period of the ban and you'd have to pay for that so and that's disincentive of course to use them um, or incentive to find other options because you have to have a permitting fee. So that's a potentially really hard a, to. Um, an in-between um, type of thing. But I, I think I think you know again I've heard from everybody. I think everybody's saying we're not ready yet to move beyond continuing the public hearing, getting additional input, hearing from our EAC, and maybe trying to bring our landscapers in to the conversation about what equipment is. Um, out there and, and do a little more investigation on that and, and how it's been um, enforced and applied elsewhere. All right. So with that, we will continue our public hearing on the leaf blower uh, law, which I think we should stop calling it leaf blowers since obviously they're just blowers and not leaf blowers. <laughs> Acorn blowers. Multi-use blowers. blowers. Multi-use blowers. We're going to have to change the name. High-powered um, blowers. Um, until our, our next public hearing is on September 25th, which is next Tuesday. Um, okay. With that, we're going on to accessory apartments, uh, local law that we have, a, a revised draft of in front of us. Um, and I'm going to ask our council to the town, Christy Tomadonna, if she would take us through changes 
that were incorporated into this and if you know where they've been incorporated from from. So the you have a revised version in front of you that was provided by David Stolman, your planner. Unfortunately, due to the rescheduling of this meeting, he was unable to attend tonight. But um, I think the process with this law is moving along more smoothly, not to put words in the town board's mouth, and please correct me if I'm wrong. But um, there were only two items that were um, revised by Mr. Stolman from the previous version, and um, I can just briefly walk you through that if you want. Um, the first is on page three of your local law in um, section A, entitled Purpose, and this doesn't actually have any regulations in it, and the language that was changed is actually a carryover from when the original local law was adopted more than a decade ago, I think probably around 2000. And this change comes from comments by the zoning board that they felt pretty strongly about. Um, and so it's, I guess it starts on the end of uh, line four. This section will further the town's goal of providing an afford affordable rental housing was crossed out and instead it put a diversity of housing in Austin. And the reason for this was because the zoning board, several members of whom are familiar with affordable housing in the legal term that we consider it often, um, thought that this may have some connotations associated with it and may create some expectations on the part of both, or obligations on the part of both property owners as well as tenants that aren't actually accurate because the way this local law is drafted, um, there are no regulations on the rent that would be charged and there's no indication of limiting what that would be um, to what we may consider affordable as is required in other places in your code. And so the zoning board just requested a change in terminology. And so um, Mr. Stolman suggested the town's goal of providing a diversity of housing, which um, it's up to the board whether you agree with that change in terminology, but really the goal was just to remove the concept of affordable housing with the connotations that come with that so that everyone's very clear on what's happening here because in all reality, people are going to rent it for what for what demand is. And so it, that probably will be a lot higher than what affordable housing and while it may be lower than what you may get in a non-accessory structure or apartment, um, it won't necessarily rise or lower to the level of being considered affordable. So that was the intent with that change. Do we have any comments on that particular change? On that particular change, no. Okay. The, the technical, though, but I just want to, just because we're dealing with affordable housing, and the, the term affordable housing means housing, your housing costs don't exceed 30% of your income. So it could be a range, it depends really on what your income is. So the it, it does tend to have a, a, a pejorative, you know, like it, it's not necessarily a positive thing, but the idea here is to create, again, I think the diversity of housing um, that will tend to be um, at least competitive with other rental situations there, thus providing a level of, of or a range of, of options for people to house that may indeed be more affordable because there's, there's an individual's ability to set rents based on what their mortgage is based on, every, their taxes and everything will vary from house to house. So I think in this place, like, there would be really no way to legislate it. It's, you're talking about much smaller dwelling sizes than anything else that would be legislated. So um, it, I, the diversity of options is works in that way, and I think it's more apt. So. And then the second change is actually on the next page, page four. And I believe this was in response to co a comment we had received from the public. It's in subsection G under ownership. And um, it says either the main dwelling or the accessory apartment must be owner occupied as the owner's primary residence, and then it added, the owner shall not rent out its dwelling unit while on vacation. Um, and I think the you all heard the comments that were made, and I think the concern was 
how do you distinguish between someone's primary residence that they live in one place for six months and the other place for six months. Um, and so I think the goal of this was to just try to clarify further what was intended there so that you don't have a situation where you know, someone gets their mail there, but they're living in Florida for eight months out of the year and then renting it out. And so you end up technically having two tenant units on one property, which isn't the intent of this law. How that would be. An owner is not an it. So their dwelling it, unit. Owner shall not rent out his or her dwelling unit while their on vacation. Dwelling unit. Unless it's owned by a corporate entity, but I, for the vast majority true, of the but time, if it's owned by a corporate entity, then, then it can't be done can't because be a it's. Resident. Well, no, I mean someone can <laughs> someone no, can create yeah. a corporate entity for the purpose of purchasing their their property. Sure. I see. I mean that's in, in this instance that's probably not what the vast majority of people are doing with their primary residences as Austin, but it does happen, and that may be where David was coming from when he framed it that way. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think we can play around with that pronoun. Okay. Just I mean, or even the rental, the dwelling. I would say the owner shall not rent out the the primary yeah. dwelling unit while on vacation. Okay. The primary dwelling unit, right? Because that's just to be clear, because the dwelling unit could also be interpreted as the accessory, the accessory apartment, even though. Right. The owner shall not rent out the primary dwelling unit. And you, I don't know, just. Uh, I don't know if you want to say while on vacation or otherwise um, not staying. Not in residence? Not staying. Well, not in residence. Well, what if you say they can't rent yeah. out the primary dwelling unit? Period. Period. They, they, what difference does it make? They can't yeah. do it anyway. Okay. No, they can't rent out the primary dwelling unit. If yes. they're renting it. Yes. Only this law. Yes. property and Legislation in place right. yet? Yeah, you could um, theoretically. Yeah, I don't. I don't think so there's any. Do you have an accessory apartment? Actually, that's my next question for this. Right. Basically, well, that, I mean, if you have an accessory apartment, then you can't do Airbnb. You can't do Airbnb in your right in your primary. Right. Yeah. Well, that's. Could if I didn't have an apartment. But I guess that's the trade off. Trade off. Actually, that was one of my questions. I didn't see it in here. Was um, do we have a, a length of lease for the accessory apartment? Like, I don't want it to be an Airbnb accessory apartment. I think that there should be at least a six month lease or something. I I do believe there was something. I thought there was, but I didn't see it, so it's probably right in front of me. I just think there should be, you know, at least, you know, a six month or yearly lease for these accessory apartments, so that we don't run into that situation of people renting it out for vacations. This is why it's so helpful to have Dave here. Mm -hmm. We're talking about these things. I thought we were further along on this that we didn't need to. If you have a room in your house now, you can rent it out as an Airbnb. So mm -hmm. then then you're just it making no a, borders. Yeah, it says no border shall be permitted. But is Airbnb a border? No. Order is defined in the on page two as a person staying at a rooming house or boarding house. So I don't know. Maybe that definition needs to be clarified. I have a question. <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm assuming that this <clears throat> is preventative maintenance. What we're talking roughly. We mm -hmm. have we had any kind of problems with this? At this, all? Came, this was brought to us by our building. I'm just but saying. I'm saying, yeah. but I, it's 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 significant because I think that it was brought to us exactly like, like that you're saying as preventative maintenance. So basically, saying that this has not happened. It's just yeah. in I, case. I'm just not seeing. What's up? I mean, I don't think that border prohibited covers it. But... I'm just talking about something else. Sorry. Okay. Um. So I th I. It's my understanding that that was brought to us exactly for that reason, for preventive maintenance, and also because uh, it's been the building department's been approached enough times to look at this, and that that was that's one of the reasons. The other reason I think is the secondary reason, which is that 
we are seeing more more people um, who want to um, age in place and may um, have an accessory structure that would be exactly um, a, a good opportunity to you know either house a child or you know whatever somebody you know or, or somebody close to them or somebody else to help offset the cost of, of staying in their home and this is of benefit to those, those people as well as to the people who then have the opportunity to rent um, in that accessory um, structure that may not be in the primary structure so there's um, I think enough opportunity in the town to make that a possibility uh, and so so from the perspective of making housing more affordable to people who already live here and want to stay here as well as to make it um, something that's feasible within the opportunities that we have in terms of what structures already exist yeah because one of the things that this does is it allows it in a detached structure where it wasn't otherwise it wasn't permitted allowed. but you're not allowed to just build a new structure in order to immediately create an accessory apartment it has to be an existing structure that would be converted or you have to wait a certain amount of time yeah and then the other thing that this this code does is it moves the sections that are governing accessory apartments into the zoning code so that it would be under the purview of the zoning board which it's currently not and so it allows the zoning board to consider interpretations and possibly variances when appropriate whereas right now if someone doesn't strictly comply with the confines of this code there's really no remedy for them at the administrative municipal level who's doing it now i thought we were leaving it with the planning it's it, it's the zoning board doing board it now. Currently does okay. the special right. permits, yeah. but it's not in the zoning code. So there's no remedy for to 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 vary any of the provisions if you don't strictly comply. Other than I guess possibly bringing Article 78, which if if someone's doing this, they're not probably likely to expend the funds to bring a litigation. Um, so this does it allows the zoning board not only to look at the application to grant the special permit, but also look at you know the other circumstances and where warranted you know if you're required to have a 10 foot setback and you have a nine foot setback see if maybe it's appropriate in that specific instance to grant a variance whereas right now they can't and that was definitely a concern that um the building inspector had right so i'd probably just want to add under g where it says borders um you know there should be either a, maybe we know, can no shorter than six month term or something along those lines or, or maybe expand upon the definition of border a little bit. Um, yeah, I think that would be better. Okay. Uh, just somehow um, make clear what's intended, which is to not have very short-term rental. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. So is that the only other issue? Any other comments on this? Okay, so we're going to continue our public hearing on this as well on September 25th, and then we will, um, yeah. And that is it for work session. Um, I would like to take a motion to go into executive session for advice of council and personnel. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, everybody, have a wonderful week. We will uh, happy um, or easy fast for those of my friends who um, are celebrating Yom Kippur on Wednesday, which is why we are meeting tonight um, and uh, Tuesday night into Wednesday. And we uh, look forward to seeing everybody next Tuesday at the courthouse at 8688 Spring Street for our regular legislative meeting. And um, am I saying, I'm not necessarily saying good night. I'm just saying that we're going into executive session. Correct? No? Yes? No? Sure. Okay. And we may be back. Okay. Bye. Right. Okay. So I'd like to take a motion to come out of executive session. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Okay, and uh, we are not taking any action or going into a special meeting. Uh, and as said before, we just like to adjourn our work session. So I don't even know if I need a motion. I don't think I do. We're going to adjourn our work session. And once again, we will see everybody next week, September 25th, at a regular meeting at 8688 Spring Street. Have a great week, everybody.